Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here. Going to do a quick uh, one here on chapter 17, looking at the Enlightenment and Revolution. Going to do a little bit on the Scientific Revolution, then I'll probably break it into a little bit on the Enlightenment aspects of that. Then we'll do a separate one on the American Revolution part of that chapter. So here we go. Hopefully my voice will hold out for this whole thing. The Scientific Revolution and Enlightenment. Let's kind of set the stage back. Columbus, 1492 by A.D. 1521. Hernan Cortez had conquered the Aztec Empire and where it is today, Mexico. At the same time, Michelangelo uh, finishes the Medici Chapel in Florence, Italy. So to kind of give you a time frame of when all these things are going on, uh, oftentimes at the same time. As part of the scientific revolution, we have this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, who presents a new view of the universe, a heliocentric one, in which the sun is at the center of the universe and the planets circle around this, around it. That's going to cause some trouble for him and other folks who promote this idea with the Catholic Church. Okay. We've also got Andre Vesalius here in 1543, illegally dissecting human bodies illegally. It's gross anatomy, I think, is because it's actually gross, not large. Um, publishes his findings in on the structure of the human body. Uh, this updates ideas that uh, have persisted in Europe dating back to the ancient Greeks and the work of Galen, uh, who had done his work on dogs and monkeys. We've also got Sir Francis Bacon, who lived from 1561 to 1626. He is the guy who develops empiricism, imperial, uh, empirical uh, investigations, which we now better re referred to as the Baconian method, and now we refer to it as the scientific method. Maybe you learned about that in science classes. This idea of having planned procedures, which becomes inductive methodologies. He also held several positions in the English government on and off throughout the years. He was popular and not popular in the in crowd and out throughout his time periods. Okay. We also have Johannes Kepler here, who used observations and math to revise that heliocentric view of the universe. Again, it's heliocentric, that is, that the sun is at the center, not the Earth. Uh, but he says the planets have elliptical orbits, not circular ones. So that's kind of changing some of the ideas of other folks. Uh, we've got a Dutch optician, uh, Hans Lippershe, who invents the telescope. Uh, early on, it's not used for observing the heavens, but for the military to watch troops on the battlefield. Imagine that new technology coming from the military. Okay. We also got Galileo, who is credited by most people with inventing the telescope, although I just told you who did that. Again, his ideas of the heliocentric uh, universe got him in trouble uh, with the Catholic Church. He's forced to recant his ideas, uh, and as we saw earlier, also other ideas about the ideas of how Kepler, saying these are not just circular, but actually elliptical. Okay, we've also got in the scientific revolution uh, an Englishman by the name of William Harvey who discovers the circulation of blood. Uh, you probably can't see it if I do this, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, my daughters love doing this to my hand to, and do to me even in church sometimes. Uh, the idea of showing how veins work with their little valves inside them. We've also got uh, in 1665 uh, Robert Hooke who invents uh, the telescope, sort of a microscope instead of looking out, looking down and in on things. And of course, we've got no scientific revolution would be complete without Sir Isaac Newton, this guy who been that below average uh, Cambridge University student uh, who was steered by one professor towards mathematics. said, maybe that's where your interest ought to go to. Uh, and he states uh, a law of gravity and invents calculus to help explain uh, the gravity and the movement of the planets. Uh, his most uh, in important uh, book is sometimes the Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or sometimes the Principia, and his three laws of motion. Well, I was going to break this, but I seem to be flying along here. So let's move on with the Enlightenment. Uh, and Rene Descartes, uh, the father of modern philosophy, or rationalism, starts his thinking from setting aside everything he's already learned and begins with cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. Hmm. It was published in his book, uh, Discourse on Method, that was in 1637. Okay, Thomas Hobbes here, who in uh, 
1651 wrote his book Leviathan. He is an English philosopher promoting the idea of absolutism. Remember the uh, pictures on the back wall there. He's often uh, blasted for a quote, often taken out of context about life being nasty, brutish, and short. They're actually sort of taking uh, a longer quote about how people live if there's no government whatsoever, uh, sort of anarchy in describing it. Uh, but he also develops many liberal ideas people don't know about, including, uh, let's see, the right of the individual, the natural equality of all men, uh, artificial character of the political order, which led to the distinction between a civil order and the state, uh, a review that, uh, view, excuse me, that all legitimate political power must be representative and based on the consent of the people, and a liberal interpretation of law which leaves people to do whatever the law does not explicitly forbid. I'll come back to that one. Uh, here's John Locke. He's the other side of that idea of uh, the social contract. Uh, two treatises of government is his book. He says, sovereignty resides not in the state, but in the uh, people, and his ideas of natural rights influence the Declaration of Independence. Okay. We also got Denis Diderot, who in uh, 1751 publishes a collection of all the known knowledge, this encyclopedia of 28 volumes. That number becomes sort of the set of volumes for years and years. Those of us who are familiar with actual books, encyclopedias as opposed to online versions may recall that. Okay. There's also a guy by the name of Rousseau who is the guy who actually developed that concept of social contract that Locke and Hobbes both talk about, uh, that a society agrees to be governed by its general will. He also believes, uh, unlike a lot of Enlightenment philosophers and scientific people of the scientific revolution, that emotions need to be followed and we've got to find a balance between emotion and reason, a balance between the two of those things. Okay. Uh, another Enlightenment thinker here uh, in AD 1748, writing his book, The Spirit of the Laws, is the Baron de Montesquieu, stating that there should be a separation of powers in the government. There should be an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. And this influences a guy by the name of James Madison, who is the father of the American Constitution. And of course, we've got uh, Thomas Jefferson, who I said was influenced by Locke when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Well, it should also be noted that uh, Locke's ideas do influence the Declaration of Independence, but it should also be noted that once Jefferson becomes president, he does the Louisiana Purchase, which wasn't explicitly stated as being allowed under the Constitution, and he was an anti-federalist, basically the strict interpretation of the Constitution, saying that if the Constitution doesn't say he can do it, he can't, but since he does it anyway because it's not forbidden, that makes him sort of allied here with Hobbes. Interesting, at least to me. And of course, what would the Enlightenment be without a connection from Mr. Pulley? That's the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment. I'll be back with the American Revolution for you in a little bit. Thanks.